when the outward circumstances of our life seems like it's out of step with God's plan for us, it can make us start to question God's promises and God's plans. It can make us start to question God's love for us. When we are facing things that seem out of step with the promises that he's made us, it can lead us to a point of crisis in faith. I'm sure that was on the front of the minds of these three young men as they were being dragged out of Jerusalem way back then to a foreign nation called Babylon. That was back when King Nebuchadnezzar had finally conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. And so what does he do? He takes all the cultural elites. He takes the upper crust of society. He takes all the leaders and he packs them up and he ships them off to exile to a foreign land called Babylon. And all of a sudden, years later, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they found themselves in a foreign country held against their will with their lives completely turned upside down and all of the outward circumstances, all of them, seeming like they weren't matching up with what had God had promised them. But you know, these three young men, they, they actually did rise to the top pretty quick. They did pretty well for themselves. They rose to power. They were smart. So much so that King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you know what, you three guys, I'm going to give you authority so that you can be the administrators of Babylon. They rose to power, and they also made some enemies. And those enemies, they took advantage of a situation brought on by, well, a deranged king. King Nebuchadnezzar, he built in a statue of himself, an idol, an image of gold. And the rule was, when the music played, you bowed down. That's it. Simple. Well, those enemies of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... They come running to King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, hey, you know those three guys, those three Jewish guys, they're not bowing down. They're the only three. They won't do it. King Nebuchadnezzar, he can't have that. So he calls them in. He calls them in and he gives them an option. Well, you've got a chance here. When the music plays, bow down. And if not, We'll throw you into a furnace, and we will burn you alive. And they said, and they said to him, our God can save you from, our God can save us from your hand, King Nebuchadnezzar. He can. And you almost just got to take a moment to chew on that response. Our God can save us from your hand, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your idol. We're going to worship the Lord. Even if he doesn't, I mean, it's an answer that sounded really good coming off the lips until they tied your hands to your sides and they picked you up and they threw you into a furnace. Oh man, I bet it sounded really good right away. But then the situation changed. All of a sudden, to everyone on the outside, these three guys looked hopeless. They looked helpless. They looked like losers. When the outward circumstances of life seem like they're out of touch or out of sync with what God has promised, it can move us and lead us to question God's plan for our lives. You know what's maybe even easier? It's maybe even easier for the outside world. Maybe even easier for the outside world to start questioning like this relationship that we have with God, and why, why we would worship this God when our lives seem to show suffering and challenges, when our lives don't seem like they're matching up with the God, Yahweh, whom we worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood on the promises that God had made them. You can hear 
You can hear it in their response, and it's beautiful. But as the outside world looks at it, it looks a little bit different. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I am your God. I'm going to care for you in the most amazing ways. I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. I'm going to rescue you. Here's a hot furnace. <laughs> you're going to get thrown into it. Something seems off about that to the outside world. And you know what? It would seem strange to us, too, if we didn't know how this story ended. Praise the Lord for that. We know this story pretty well. But have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about this? God could have put the fire out. God could have put the fire out. God could have certainly snuffed out the fire just like that. He's got the power to do it. We know that. He could have put the fire out, and he could have punished Nebuchadnezzar right then and there. It could have happened. But he didn't. He didn't. He saved those men in the fire, not from the fire. Now that's a twist. <laughs> Maybe it gets you thinking about the cross. Maybe it gets you thinking about Jesus and his cup. Maybe it gets you thinking about life through death. But I think it's really important for us this morning to get something straight. We are not saying this morning that God will always rescue us from the present sufferings that are going on in our lives. He will always take away that specific suffering that we're facing right now. Take that world. Take that. No, we're not saying that this morning. We're not saying that because... God doesn't promise us that. We're also not saying this morning that this true story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a blazing furnace with fire surrounding them, it's all about the fires and the challenges that we're facing in this life and how maybe if we're going through challenges for one month, one year, or even longer than that, that eventually... Eventually, maybe next year, it'll all just go away, kind of like this fire did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego minutes later. No, we're not saying that either. We're not saying that either. God does not promise us that. So what are we saying? What can we say? We can say, God is always with us. We can say, God will deliver us. We can say the words, even if he doesn't. Why? We've got a promise. We have a promise. And it's this. Jesus Christ has not promised to rescue us from experiencing death, bad news, or challenges. He's rescued us. And he's given us victory over death. That, that we can say. But sometimes our hearts aren't satisfied with that. Oh, man, sometimes our hearts are not satisfied with that. Sometimes our flesh and the way the world works, they tell us that strength and happiness and good years of life, oh, boy, they come and they're noticed based on the outward circumstances. Sometimes our hearts start asking questions like, God, God, this can't be the end, can it? This cannot be the end, can it, Lord? Lord, can you fix this and can you fix it right now? Sometimes our hearts, they start making statements like, Lord, I'd be happier. I would be happier if you could just fix this right here, right now. Lord, I promise, I promise I will look at life differently. I will, I will look at life differently if you just stepped in right now. Just step in, Lord. What would a life like that look like? What would a life where God stepped in look like? I know a few. I know a few. I'm looking at them. I get to look at them this morning. Some of you have had to wrestle with moments where 
you weren't sure how many more months, years, maybe even moments you had left. Some of you have had to wrestle with suffering to such a degree that you wonder and begin to wonder if it's just going to leave you in pieces. What would a life look like where God stepped in? We're looking at it this morning. You saw it when you woke up in the mirror this morning. You saw it. You saw it the moment you walked in here through those doors. You saw it the moment you sat down and you looked around and you saw people and you noticed where they were sitting. You saw your church family. You saw it. You heard it. You heard it through the voices that were singing hymns about grace and grace for me and grace for us and grace for you. Oh man, what would a life look like where God stepped in? We're looking at it today. We get to read about it. Get to read about it when we read about the disciples. Get to read about it when we, when we hear about a guy named Paul who used to be named Saul, but not anymore. He's Paul because God stepped in there too. Get to think about it as we look back and think about Luther. God intervened there too through his word more than 500 years ago. What does a life like that look like? It's a life full of relief. Oh boy, it's a life full of relief. It's full of tears, but not, not just tears of sadness, tears of relief, of joy. It's a life that, that maybe says, I'm going to cherish every moment from here on out. I'm going to tell the people that are closest to me, my family, I'm going to tell them that I love them. I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to let people know how much they're loved. What does a life like that look like? It's a life that hears God daily say, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. No, no, no. I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. I'm going to love you in the most amazing way. I am your God. I am your Redeemer. I'm going to give you my Son. A life like that is not based, is not contingent on the outward circumstances. No way. It cannot be. It cannot be. A life like that is not based on health or wealth or power or even relationships. No, a life like that is so outside of our way of thinking and God reveals it to us in a baby. A life like that has peace, but not just peace in dying, not just peace in death, peace in a forgiveness that lasts forever, full and free for you, for me. For us through Christ. That right there can't be found in outward circumstances. It can't be. It can't be. It's found so outside of our way of thinking. It's found in a baby in a manger. It's found in a baby in a manger. A baby that years later wise men from Babylon? The same location where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a furnace and it seemed like the gospel with them about to be shut up and shut down forever. But it wasn't. It was shared. The stories were told. The gospel was proclaimed and so three men, three wise men, years later from Babylon would go and they would go find this baby. And they would glorify him. The Savior, the rescuer, not from experiencing death or bad news or challenges. The Savior, our Savior, who gives us victory over death. What would a life look like where God stepped in? We get to look at it today. We're living it right now. It's a life of courageous witness. It's a life of courageous witness. So let's share it. And let's start small. Let's share it. 
Let the neighbors see it. Share it with the family. Share it with friends. Share it at home. Let that message of grace, full and free, be something that we bask in, that we shower ourselves in through the words of Scripture. Share it. Share it with the kids and grandkids. Let them know how God has intervened in our lives. Share it with them. That doesn't mean you have to preach a sermon. No way. No, not necessarily. It just means you get to take them to the cross. And as you take them to the cross, you go there with them. Because it's at the cross where we find a love that lasts forever, a forgiveness that lasts forever. It's where we find God intervening in our lives. And you know what happens when we share it? You know what happens? We believe it. We repeat it. It's shared. Generation after generation, it sticks. God's word lasts forever. His word will always be there. You know what happens when we share it? It becomes our own self-talk. It does. It becomes what we repeat to ourselves day in and day out. That truth becomes what we go back to even when the outward circumstances show opposite. We run back to that. Share it. Hold on to it. It's the truth that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood on when life seemed like it was chaotic. It's the truth that Martin Luther stood on when it seemed like the world was coming down and crashing. It's the truth that he stood on when he found nothing in himself. It's the truth that we get to stand on when the lies of Satan come at us. It's the truth that we will always be able to stand on even when the outward circumstances show opposite. Live like you're going to live forever because you are. Live like a courageous witness and share. Share that grace full and free. Amen. This time I want to ask you all to please stand if you're able and we will use the words of the Apostles' Creed to confess our faith with Christians across the world.